Hey everybody, Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust and we're continuing our coverage of the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Chancellorsville. We have a whole gaggle of guests with us out here at the Jackson Flank Attack. Um, and we are on tour stop number eight on the Chancellorsville Driving Tour. This is part of Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. But before we jump into the action and orient you to where we're standing, Please head over uh, to our battlefields.org uh, website. Check out all the free items that we have for you. Maybe check out that membership option. Also head over to the Google Play Store, over to iTunes, and download the Chancellorsville Battle app. That's free for you. you download that. Learn more about this battle from the former chief historian at the park, Bob Crick. Um, he is one of the, the great living legends of the Chancellorsville historians. Uh, and you can also go over to our YouTube channel, Facebook, or Twitter, and make sure that you click the subscribe or follow us on, on um, Twitter or on Facebook. We want to make sure that you can have access to all these videos. And please, of course, share these with your friends and your family. And as we're standing out here, this video, if you haven't been following along, um, comes on the heels of our Jackson flank attack video where we actually drove around Jackson's flank attack. We took some time, stopped at the Lee Jackson bivouac site, went to the Welford house, and we also went to the Catherine Iron Furnace. And then we ended up out here. So we're picking up the story of Chancellorsville. And before I bring on uh, our first guest here, I want to uh, just orient you to where we're standing. So we are on the extreme right flank of the Union Army. This would have been held by Oliver Otis Howard's 11th Army Corps. About 56% of that corps is made up of uh, immigrants, not all Germans, but of uh, European descent who had come over here many recently in the 1840s and 50s and have joined up with the Union Army. It is the smallest corps, and a corps in the Civil War setting is like a mini army. You'll have infantry, the foot soldiers, you'll have artillery, the cannons, and sometimes you'll have horsemen, the cavalry, to go along with you. And the idea behind these is these many armies uh, can fight for a time on their own, and then you bring more corps together and more corps together. So the 11th Corps out here is actually going to be isolated and by itself. It has roughly 11,000 men. It's on the right flank of the army, and it's isolated because down the road from us, the Union 3rd Army Corps in our last video had moved down to the Catherine Iron Furnace and created a gap between us and the rest of the Federal Army. Where are they? Okay. So directly behind the camera is West. That'll lead you out to the wilderness. Behind you will also be Jackson's three divisions forming to attack where we are standing on the evening of May 2nd, 1863. The Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers are off to our right and to our right rear. That's the north of where we are. Off to my left, you might be able to make out some traffic and that is the Orange Turnpike. That is an east-west thoroughfare that would carry you from Fredericksburg, about 14 miles to the east of us, out to Culpeper, and or out to Orange Courthouse eventually where it branches off to onto another road. Um, so that is a major thoroughfare. The Union 11th Corps line is roughly aligned right along that road, and then part of it will be refused or bent back towards where we are standing. Then out in the distance, you might notice a few structures. I'm gonna step out of the way of the camera for a moment. There's a brick structure with a white truck that I can see today. And that is roughly the Wilderness Church area. The Wilderness Church, um, the one that was standing here at the wartime was circa 1853. And it sat about 150 yards on the north side of the Orange Turnpike. Um, it was a Wilderness Baptist Church. Its uh, preacher was Melzai Chancellor who owns a uh, tavern across the street known as Dowdle's Tavern. He also at one point owned a place that we'll visit later on in our video swing, a place called Hazel Grove. Off to the left of that uh, structure, the Wilderness Church, will be a green-topped modern barn, which was not here at the time of the battle, uh, but that roughly marks what we call the Bushbeck Line. It was commanded by a guy named Adolphus Bushbeck. Um, we'll get into the bigger story here at at uh, Chancellorsville, but the bulk of the 11th Corps is facing off to the camera's right towards the south. Uh, but Bushbeck and some other officers realize as the day goes on that there might be a threat out to the west, off to their right. So Bushbeck will start to deploy his brigade facing out to the west and start building in fortifications. Um, so he'll build a line of fortifications that they can fall back to. It's a fallback position. Off to the left of that is a modern barn, a little bit closer in the foreground, and that would be the Hawkins Farm. Hawkins Farm uh, was a wartime uh, a farm. That structure you're looking at is not from the wartime, but the family who owns it today owned it at the time of the American Civil War. 
There's actually a road trace leading off just uh, near that barn that you might be able to see there in the, in the video, um, off into the woods, and that would lead you off on Ely's Ford's Wood Road, um, and parts of that road trace still exist today. So that's what you're kind of looking at. Chancellorsville, as the crow flies, is a little more than two miles to the west of uh, or the east of us, straight out in that general direction right out in front of the camera. Um, and to the south of us will be Stonewall Jackson's column moving around our front and then eventually behind the camera where they're deploying to the west. So that's what it's going to look like. If you're here on the afternoon of May 2nd, 1863, you'll be looking out into the fields of the 11th Corps out here on the, the fields of the Hawkins Farm, the Talley Farm, the Burton Farm. Many of these guys are not in line of battle. They're actually going to be having dinner. Guns are stacked up. They look like they're in a TP formation, and most of them are not prepared to meet an assault. Uh, though all the indicators are there that something is coming and something's amiss. And to talk about that, I'm going to bring on our Stonewall Jackson fanboy, it's Chris Mikowski. Chris will do anything for a Stonewall Jackson bust chocolate bar, bad painting, anything. Yeah, that's right, chocolate, uh, Stonewall Jack and chocolate. Wow, I mean, just incredible stuff. Have you, if we have seen it all, you <laughs> sent me a picture of a postcard from Jackson, Mississippi of the Stonewall Inn the other the day. Stonewall Jackson Inn in Jackson, Mississippi, where he never was or ever stayed. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about what Chris was telling you about just moments ago, as you look at this landscape over my shoulder, look how tumultuous it is. And I can't stress that enough. It is tumultuous ground. I always think about a ship being out at sea in a big storm and you just have all these waves coming from all these different directions and that's what this landscape looks like that becomes important because when Jackson does make his attack here in a few minutes um, there's no place we can you know really rally out here there's no good ridge line that you can have a defense where you're protecting your flanks you have pockets of space where you might be able to try to resist and a pocket in an attack that big is no resistance at all um, one of the one Confederate says that uh, that the Federals ran like the devil was on their heels, and you would too if Stonewall Jackson was after you. And that's why it's just the terrain doesn't give you an opportunity to really rally and resist. As Jackson gets his men into position after that long 14-mile march uh, from the bivouac site past the furnace that we traced in that earlier video, I urge you to go and watch it. They start to get into position about a mile behind where Sarah is standing with the camera. Robert Rhodes. Uh, Division is in the, in the lead, so they're going to deploy first. Raleigh Colston's going to come up after and deploy behind them. So they're going to be stacked essentially like a giant fist. AP Hill's men are just coming up past the furnace, even as Jackson's first scouting this area up. That's how long that column is. So he can't wait for them. As we mentioned earlier, uh, the clock is ticking. If things go dark as this attack's going forward, Jackson's going to be able to lose his ability to coordinate and command. So he really needs to take advantage of as much daylight as he has. So he gets his fist together. AP Hill will come in as the reserves. Now there's a great story as he's watching his men assemble in roads, kind of being in charge of the attack as the uh, lead division. Uh, there are some 12 or 15 staff members, officers who had some sort of affiliation with the Virginia Military Institute where Jackson had uh, taught before the war. And he lets his school spirit show here. A great little moment of humanity for this man that most people look at as, as very iconic. And he says, the Institute shall be heard from today. Okay, and I feel like cheerleaders should burst forward and start cheering because that's as much school spirit as we're going to hear out of Stonewall Jackson. So as things assemble, it's going to be set for a, a 5.15 departure time. And as things get closer, Jackson consults with Rhodes. He asks, are you ready? Rhodes finally says, I am. And Jackson says, you may begin. And the attack formation is going to start rolling forward through the wilderness behind you. Now, that attack formation is so big, even with just Rhodes Division in the front, lining guys up uh, in a brigade level, you've got people standing shoulder to shoulder. That line's going to stretch a mile to the north of the turnpike and a mile to the south of the turnpike. You're pushing forward with two miles of men. And of course, you've got one row plus a second row behind them as they're advancing, and you're stacking up your brigades that way. So we've got a huge fist that's two miles wide coming up this road. And as Chris mentioned, the 11th Corps is spread out in this field. We talk about the wilderness being 75 square miles of second growth deciduous jungle, but in fact, there are pockets of openings, including the farms here, where the uh, Union Army is able to kind of spread out just a little bit. Now, 
Oliver Otis Howard had been warned there might be a threat off to the west. And Howard, old prayer book as he's known, he said, oh, yes, good. <laughs> and he doesn't do much to defend himself. In fact, it's on the regimental and brigade level where officers are like, maybe we should. Uh, uh. There are pickets, if we look off to my left, there are pickets who are out in the woods there. They have heard Jackson's movement. This is not a surprise movement at this point. And so all this intelligence is coming back on the regimental and brigade levels. And so they're starting to think maybe we should do something to protect ourselves. They actually will go to a Devon's and say, hey, listen, we should, uh, we should uh, re refuse our flag. We should do something. And he dismisses them. In fact, he will um, actually uh, uh, threaten to put people under arrest if they keep harassing him. So it's going to be really up to the uh, individual initiative of regimental commanders. And on this ridge, off to my right, we'll see some of our gaggle of historians as they try to rush out of the view here for a second. They're going to use this ridge line as a place to refuse their flag. By that, they're going to really put a, a, a 45 degree bend in their line, just like an elbow. This would be a refusal. And by doing that, they're going to give themselves a little bit of topography to try to anchor their position and look off to the west. They'll have a couple of artillery pieces pointed in that direction as well. But that's all the preparation that this army makes to receive any sort of threat. Joe Hooker has convinced himself that the Confederates are retreating off toward Gordonsville. All this noise is just a bunch of nonsense. But in fact, we have two miles of men coming in this direction, getting ready to launch uh, an attack that is going to really change the course of, uh, of the war up to this point. So, let's, Sarah, let's take a walk over here. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. Um, you're out at the Jackson Flank Attack wounding, or <laughs> Jackson Flank Attack site. We'll go to his wounding site later. The 11th Corps do not like Oliver Otis Howard. I do not like Oliver Otis Howard. But uh, Howard was a West Point graduate of the class of 1854. Um, he's from Maine. He had gone to Bowdoin College for you Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain fans. I'm still trying to get over the whole Chris Bukowski cheerleading for Stonewall Jackson while he's out here for his school spirit. Um, but uh, uh, Howard, when he takes over this 11th Corps, actually wasn't supposed to get this corps. Um, in the midst of the, uh, the reshuffling of this army after Fredericksburg, when Joe Hooker takes over the army in January of 1863, he starts to replace some, some officers. One man that is replaced in the Third Corps is George Stoneman. He was in charge of Third Corps. He eventually gets kicked up to run uh, the Cavalry Corps that was newly formed under Hooker. But the next general in line to take over Third Corps by seniority was Oliver Otis Howard. Howard gets skipped by Hooker because Dan Sickles is a better politician, quite frankly, than Oliver Otis Howard. Then when this happened, Oliver Otis Howard being the child that he is, and he will act like a child on this battlefield, Gettysburg, and other places, he is going to throw a temper tantrum, and he's given 11th Corps. Because the 11th Corps, one month prior to this battle, will actually um, get, uh, get a new commander, Franz Siegel, who really wasn't up for core command was transferred out Howard was put in that makes him happy ironically down the road whenever James Birdsey McPherson goes down outside of Atlanta um, in charge of the Army of Tennessee the next man up to take over by seniority was Joe Hooker who got command of Army of Tennessee it's Oliver Otis Howard which is a big slap in the face to to Joe Hooker because he blames him for his loss here at Chancellorsville um, so the 11th Corps who's out here, we have a real mixed bag. We have quality units. We do have quality units out here, but we also have a lot of untested units. Behind me, alone in Carl Schurz's division, uh, Schurz, uh, we could make a movie out of his life. He's a fa fascinating character. Um, he's, a, he, he's an 1848er who goes out and uh, is one of these guys who, who's a German revolutionary who breaks out one of his uh, professors from Spandau prison, goes through the sewers of Berlin, gets out, gets kicked out of France, kicked out of England, and sent over here to the United States where he settles up in Wisconsin of all places. But Schertz looks more like a college professor than a general, and he's worried about what's going on out here. And he's got about, I think, eight new regiments in his, in his division. We also have Adolf von Steinwehr. So as we come along here, we have the 11th Corps laid out. We have the Karl Schurz, who's a German. We have Adolf von Steinwehr, who's Prussian. Then we come over into this sector and we come into a guy named Charles Devins, who is not a West Pointer. He is not a German either. 
but he's xenophobic, he hates Germans, and he doesn't take uh, command of this 1st Division of the 11th Corps that seriously. In fact, when officers are coming back and saying, we need to make dispositions for someone coming out in this direction, he keeps scoffing at them and, and pushing them to the side. He's also drinking that day too, so that didn't help. So we have a mixed bag out here. We also have a unit who doesn't know how to win. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. They have been manhandled, the units who are veterans, they have been manhandled by Stonewall Jackson before. They've been manhandled in the valley. They've been manhandled at 2nd Manassas. They miss Fredericksburg, luckily for them and Antietam, but they come here to Chancellorsville, so we have new units mixed with units that haven't won a battle yet. So this core is a real amalgamation. We have foreigners, we have natural born U.S. citizens, we have, uh, we have a, our, a core commander who isn't really that liked by his own men. We have division commanders who don't take their men seriously. We have others who love their men. So we have a real mixed bag. We have morale problems here. And unfortunately, it has nothing to do with the men in the ranks, really. It has everything to do with that higher command. And that's kind of the story here at Chancellorsville. We'll see for the Union unpacking. So in this general vicinity, we would be in and behind the line of Nathaniel McLean. We also have a brigade out here led by Leopold von Gilsa. Von Gilsa has New York regiments and a, the 153rd Pennsylvania who's facing off to the west. The 153rd Pennsylvania is a nine-month regiment who will hold the right flank here at Chancellorsville on, on May 2nd and be swept from the field and do the same thing July 1st, 1863 at Gettysburg when they're swept off a of Blocker's Knoll. We call it Barlow's Knoll today. If I'm with the 153rd PA, I'm asking for my money back for this ride. But these poor guys are out on the flank saying make dispositions to meet this enemy. Throughout the day, Hooker, his staff, and others have come out onto this flank. They've talked with Oliver Otis Howard, and he has done very, very little to make dispositions to meet that enemy. He'll turn some of his reserve guns to point in that direction. He'll send one signal officer down the road. He claims that his skirmishers were more than a half mile out in front where they should be. But they're not. We know this because the skirmishers themselves write that they weren't in the right place, and the Confederates say the same thing. They expected to run into skirmishers just you know, a half mile out, but they were actually only about 200-ish yards out in front of the lines. Some cavalry go out and up through these woods behind me, or behind the camera. They ride for 10 minutes and turn around. They don't go out far enough to see if there's anything out there. Over and over again, men like John Lee of the 75th Ohio, or uh, yeah, 75th Ohio will come in here and they will say, hey, there's something going on. And time and again, they're sent back to their, back to their units, chastised most of the time. And we'll add to our woes, Oliver Otis Howard, though I don't think it would have made a difference, honestly, if he was here when this attack started, rode with his reserve brigade, commanded by Francis Barlow, down to the Catherine Iron Furnace. Because when Hooker sees that column heading down to the south towards the Catherine Iron Furnace, he is going to unleash Devil Dan Sickles on them. Sickles will say, man, they're retreating. Let's go after them tomorrow. He gets 60 rounds of ammunition, three days rations, and the next day he'll be the vanguard of the army. We need to bolster them. Nothing's happening out on the right flank. So we've now isolated the 11th Corps by taking the next corps over the third away from us on our left flank. And now Howard is told to send his reserve brigade down to the furnace. Nothing's going on out here. So Howard decides to ride along. So we are now the 11th Corps. We are now down below 11,000 men. We're mostly faced to the south. Our commanding general is not on the field. Our other commanding generals don't always take us seriously, and now we only have 800 men facing to the west to meet the first line of Jackson, who has more than 9,000 men in it. Jackson's line way outflanks the Confederate or the Union right flank. They'll be to the mile to the north and the south of the plank or of the uh, turnpike, which is just behind me, using that as what we call an axis of advance. We'll follow that along, and then at about 5 to 5:15 that evening. Stonewall Jackson will say something along the lines of uh, to Robert Rhodes, are you ready? Rhodes, the lead division commander, will say yes, and he will say you can go forward then. And at that moment, the Confederates will start sending waves forward. With the first wave will be led by Robert Rhodes, uh, 34 years old, Virginia Military Institute graduate, followed by 37-year-old Raleigh Colston's division, and then A.P. Hill's division, also 37 years old, will come up from the behind. So we'll have this wave, as Chris pointed out, wave after wave. It's not like God's in Jackson. 
that you'll have the same Confederate line coming over and over again at you. Watch that lazy editing in that movie. You'll see the same Confederates charging the same time over and over and over again, but there will be waves of Confederates coming forward. First thing that we know about this, how do we know if we're a Union soldier? What's coming towards us? Deer, turkey, quail, rabbits all come running towards us. Even a black bear will come running out of the woods towards the, the uh, Yankees. Some guys are gonna start laughing like, what's going on over here? Others realize what's happening. And that is the Confederates are coming out of the woods in force towards our flank and they're not ready to meet it. You guys want me to keep rolling or? Keep rolling, keep rolling. <laughs> Dan, you got something? Come on. Yeah. All right. Going back to the, his days at West Point and during the Mexican War, the war with Mexico, Stonewall Jackson was an artillerist. And he's going to make sure that when his attack moves forward on the evening of May 2nd, 1863, that his men go forward with artillery support. And that artillery support comes in the form of actually Jib Stewart's chief of horse artillery, Robert Beckham. Beckham, if you're familiar with the Stewart horse artillery, had replaced John Pelham, who'd been mortally wounded just a couple months prior during the battle at Kelly's Ford. And with Breathed comes or excuse me, with Beckham comes James Breathed's battery, two gun sections coming in directly behind the infantry, followed by Marcellus Mormon's battery. And Mormon and Breathed are gonna rake havoc along with the infantry as they crash into the Union lines out here along the Orange Turnpike. Interestingly enough, fast forward a couple of years during the Tennessee campaign in 1864, Robert Beckett himself is going to be mortally wounded during fighting at Columbia, Tennessee, November 29th, 1864. So if you're one of the first couple commanders of the Stuart Horse Artillery, you don't really have a good track record in uh, surviving the war. And now I'm going to turn it over to one of my colleagues. Okay, getting back to what Chris White said about the Germans, there's going to be this one German that Carl Schurz knows pretty well, and he's thought of as a very good and experienced soldier. His name is Captain Hubert Dilger, and he's going to be in command of one of the batteries of the 1st Light Artillery of Ohio. Now, he knows something is going on before Jackson's flank attack, but he wants to go find out for himself. So he is going to take an orderly, and he is going to go in the front lines. Like Chris was talking about, Von Gilza was out there. He goes past Von Gilza and then quickly realizes that he's around Confederates. They block his path, so he and the orderly ride to the north and then come back east and they get to General Howard's headquarters. They want to tell him what they've seen and Howard's not here. He's gone with Barlow. So they send him down to General Hooker's headquarters and a cavalry major there laughs at his story and sends him back to his post. So he comes back up here and he lets people know, he lets General Schurz know, and now at least Schurz knows that the Confederates are on their way. So when the flank attack begins and Schurz starts seeing people running back, he is going to turn his division around to face the West. Yeah, and so what we're going to see out here, and just to correct myself, it was John Lee was with the 55th Ohio. There's a lot of Ohio regiments out here. Uh, Robert Riley was in charge of the 75th that I was talking about. Um, but John Lee was, was sent back chastised. We have others like Colonel Riley who was sent back. Um, uh, Colonel Devins will say to, uh, uh, to Colonel, uh, to, to Nathaniel McLean, I know that Robert E. Lee is retreating. Uh, he turned to his brigade commander, Nathaniel McLean, and said, I guess the, that Colonel Richardson um, is somewhat scared. You had better order him back to his regiment. So these men are not only being told that they're wrong, they're also being challenged their manhood and told that they're scared. Um, you know, we had the 55th Ohio, the 25th, the 107th Ohio. These were Midwesterners and not always made up of German Americans. Um, but Charles Devins, the division commander out here, he was from Boston area. He was from Massachusetts and he looked his nose down at these Midwesterners. He looked his nose down at these, these Germans and others. Um, but like others were saying, but at 2.45 in the afternoon, a large body of the enemy is massing in my front. For God's sake, make dispositions to receive them. Um, Devins would then retort, no force could penetrate the outlying thickets, meaning that the dense second growth forests of the wilderness 
could not be, be penetrated. And just to give you an idea of what, um, uh, what they would say about the, the, the um, wilderness, it's a uh, generally level barren covered with a matted growth of scrub pine, sweet gum, brush, and dogwood. The surface of the earth is indented occasionally with low basins through which the rainfall washing from higher margins cuts long gullies and often deep and wide washouts. Another man would say a large portion of this, uh, of this region extending east and west along the Plank and Pike and to the south nearly to Spotsylvania is called the wilderness, a most appropriate term of a land of exhausted sandy soil supporting more or less dense growth of pine or of oak. So what Howard will do He's actually not going to put inside uh, of the logbook for the 11th Corps orders from Joe Hooker uh, to make dispositions for this uh, this uh, attack to meet them. He'll actually put them in after Joe Hooker was fired because he's going to claim that, no, I never received those, those orders. Um, but there's a whole other story there that we could always get into. And Howard's men are not ready to receive this. In fact, if you read the German-American papers afterwards, they're going to call Howard stupid. They're going to call him an idiot. They're going to attack him left and right, just like they were being chastised out here in the midst of this battle by their commanding officers. They are going to say the same things in the German-American papers in places like Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and other very heavily German, German parts of the, the towns. But before we cut and go to another portion of this, this field, and we want you to stay with us because we're going to keep talking Jackson flank attack, imagine what's now happening. Most of our troops are faced to the south, faced off in the direction where I am, and Jackson's coming off in this direction. We fight in the Civil War using what we call linear tactics. Guys are in square and rectangle formations. So to get from this point to face in this direction, we have to move our men in blocks. And if the Confederates are pushing this direction, they're pushing wildlife towards us, they're pushing our own men towards us, we now have to try to turn and meet this tide of humans as well as animals. That's gonna break up your unit cohesion. And in fact, we can basically follow the 11th Corps line and how fast it fell. And I don't mean any disrespect to these guys out here because as Chris Mikowski pointed out, if Stonewall Jackson's on your flank, you're probably running too. But if you read their reports, some will say we fired one shot. Some will say we fired three. If you can fire three aim shots in a minute, they stood for a minute. Six shots, two minutes. You can go down the line and just count up how many rounds they expended. And that's about as long as they stayed on this battle line out here. And it wasn't always because the Confederates were coming. They might've been displaced by their own men. But Schertz and others will put up lines behind us. Men like the 26th Wisconsin, the 82nd Illinois, the only Illinois Infantry Regiment at the battlefield at Chancellorsville, and it also had the only future president, a guy named Emil uh, Fry, who was the president of the Swiss Confederation in the 1890s. Useless fact number two for this uh, video. Um, also the only future president to serve at Gettysburg. Um, they will be out in these fields trying to meet this threat, but they're not in a great continuous line. They're new to battle, these are new units, and then we'll have other men out here like Hubert Dilger, known as Leather Breeches, trying to fire shells out here from his 12-pounder Napoleons. And we have just a melee that will come through here as the Confederates push forward, eat, shout, fire, and rush on, according to one Confederate general named Alfred Iverson. Before we head over to the 11th Corps' fallback position, and we really explain what's happening here, I'm gonna bring on Chris Mikowski, who I think wants to come out here and say something about Stonewall Jackson's cheerleaders. <laughs> rah, rah, go fight win. Uh, I also wanna thank Stuart Henderson, who came on just a few moments ago. Uh, he's a longtime historian, he's worked with us for many, many years. It's great to see him out here. When Chris talks about those formations, it just brought to mind for me, that has an impact on the Confederates as well. Remember too, that Robert Rhodes and Raleigh Colston, first time at division command, AP Hill, the most experience of Jackson's uh, division commanders, he's going to be in the rear. So imagine if someone more experienced had been closer to the front. As pockets of resistance try to form on these hills behind me, we talked about how difficult that is as topography. But think from the Confederate perspective, you have a long line. Chris talked about these linear movements. This long line hits one of these little knobs. And if we think about it like this, they curve in on either side of these knobs. That's what's going to cause that two mile a line to start contracting in on itself. So even as Chris talked about the Federals falling back across these fields, the Confederates too are advancing, but they're contracting as they do so, which is gonna then 
pose some interesting challenges for them as they get up a little closer. We're going to follow that advance or that fallback, depending on which side we're with, and we're going to visit some other property here on the flank attack that you have helped save, so we want to make sure that you have the chance to see it.